Uh, I think uh, it's about time to start. This is the last uh, the last talk today, and uh, I don't want to to, uh, to keep you too much here uh, because we are all, I guess, uh, coming to have a beer after that uh, talk. So um, the talk would be uh, about, uh, as you can see, reactive beyond hype, which basically means that we wanted to do some uh, experimentation, which turned out to be some kind of an open journey to figure out how much gains can we have in a reactive uh, stack for our application comparing to, to the classical synchronous stack which operates on the, operates on the blocking threads. Um, so there would be three presenters on, these, uh, on this presentation and we all work at Virtus Lab. I would be, I would be doing uh, introduction. So uh, after that, uh, Martin will, will tell, uh, talk about the methodology that we used to, to do our experimentation to measure things. And um, uh, the last part would be the results, right? So what we managed to achieve. We are uh, convinced that we didn't manage to achieve everything that we could. And there are many open questions that we don't know answer to. And as I mentioned at the beginning, it's a part of the journey. Uh, so. Before we start, it might be interesting to ask the question what the reactive really is, right? We are on the reactive conference and still it seems that there is some confusion. Well, there was this reactive manifesto a couple of years ago and um, it seems that this reactive manifesto was pretty much uh, popular. So you have like here you can see there's uh, 20 plus thousand people, I guess developers that, uh, that signed this manifesto, which I guess uh, implies that they agree with the uh, with the content, right? With the spirit of the manifesto, with the design principles that are in this manifesto. Now, the confusion about is that uh, what we usually mean as a reactive is those uh, those design concerns uh, or design principles uh, that basically allows you uh, by by doing you know message driven uh, communication and. Uh, uh, going into the elasticity, which means that you basically can scale out and scale out depending on the load which is imposed on the on your application, and that the application can uh, can uh, be still operational even experiencing failures, which is resilient. Uh, this all uh, basically leads you to this responsiveness. Uh, there is. I was always thinking why the name reactive and and, and kind of a one way of thinking about this is that when you think about messaging it's reacting to events when you think about elasticity it's re uh, reacting to the load and especially load variation and uh resilient is reaction to failure and that's react to users being responsiveness is kind of a holy grail of the whole uh reactive thing right so we want to be able to respond to users right whatever happens now uh, there is this term reactive programming and it turns out that those libraries that are pretty common throughout different languages are really referring mostly to reactive programming, not the, the reactive uh, design principles. Uh, and reactive programming can be somewhat, you know, low level building block with which you can use, you, you can build reactive systems. And it's, it's really spilled even outside, you know, the uh, Scala uh, world because even recently we have this uh, reactive being uh, brought into Spring framework. So something is there, right? So there is uh, uh, some uh, popularity of the approach. Now, uh, from the reactive programming, reactive programming basically like of the, the, to, to much extent, it's about uh, asynchronous non-blocking communication and stream processing. And many, most of these libraries are, to much extent, focusing on these uh, these parts. So the question that might be asked is, why async and non-blocking communica uh, communication, or in general, the I/O is important? Well, we all know that because we are on the uh, on the reactive conference. So we basically, know that the idea that the uh, that the classical uh, scaling by adding number of threads. Uh, is not really that much scalable because if you have, for instance, on the server side, thread per request, and on the client side, when you want to shoot to the server, uh, you need to block the request. Uh, that might scale until some point, but when you start to have, uh, maybe not tens, but hundreds of uh, threads, the uh, things like cache locality or things like context switching will start to hit you hard. Um, so the question that is also 
perhaps worth to you know uh, clearly uh, clearly answer to is or at least uh, to have some clearer answer to is this asynchronous this dichotomy between asynchronous and synchronous and blocking and non-blocking. So if we take a look at for instance this uh, system level call system operating level uh, call which is uh, from the Linux operating system receive. Uh, it is an example of a non-blocking uh, call, assuming that the socket that, 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 uh, that it is invoked on is a non-blocking socket. So how it works basically is that if you have a non-blocking socket and you, uh, and you use the uh, receive call on it, uh, if there are data in the socket uh, waiting to, to be taken, well, you will receive the data. But if there, are no da there is no data, you would get the... Uh, uh, you would get the error code, E again or E would block, which basically means that this call would never block. It is synchronous, but it's not blocking. And if we go a little bit higher in the, in the you know, abstractions, that's something that is maybe we are more familiar as uh, Scala or Java or JVM developers is Sleek3. So Sleek3 is, when it, when it appeared, it was uh, claimed to be a re reactive uh, database, a, re a relational database uh, library. So basically what it does is that it allows you to compose, to, to generate some operations into the descriptions, which are called DBIO, uh, or actually in the long form DB, uh, DB actions, DBIO actions. Uh, and uh, if you, if you run, uh, run a DB run, they would basically return the future. But the trick here, although it looks asynchronous, is that what happens really underneath is that you know, GDBC is a synchronous blocking API, right? So something is blocking there. We just don't see it because Sleek uh, handles its uh, internal thread pool. It's all fun uh, and games when we have simple calls like here. But if we if we have a like more complicated thing, which in, in many traditional applications we had, or we have, like we have uh, several transactions and uh, several operations, uh, and we would like to compose them all and run them in a single transaction. Well, we would still be blocking this single, that's the thread on the thread pools for uh, for a significant amount of significant amount of time, because uh, uh, because mm, the, uh, the 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 way how JDBC is uh, works is that first it's blocking blocking uh, blocking the thread that is used to to, to invoke the uh, invoke the operation, and second it doesn't allow you to do multiplexing on a single connection, especially if you have a transaction. You cannot make multiple different requests from different logical users on the same, uh, on the same connection. Now, on the other hand, if you take a look at Cassandra driver, you have something that is superficially similar, right? You have this session execute async that allows you to execute asynchronous operation. We have two of them and uh, the difference here, however, is well, at the end we have a future, so it's asyn two asynchronous calls. But the the kind of a, uh, how it works inside is that first of all, it's truly asynchronous. It uses Netty underneath, and uh, on the other hand, it also supports uh, multiplexing. So we can have much lower number of connections on a on a given server comparing to JDBC connections, right? So there is a stream ID at some point created. We send the request to the to the database, and when it's back, it's it's directed to the when the response is back, it's directed to appropriate result set future. So you can see that it's well, uh, some of those libraries are called reactive, uh, like Sleek, and uh, this asynchronous and non-blocking communication is performed in a very different way. So the question that that we have is, well, what is the effect? What is the actual gain that we might have from this? Uh, from using uh, those libraries. And it seems that we all take those things as granted because if you go, for instance, to Rust uh, ecosystem, it seems there is a question in the Rust ecosystem, what needs to be done to take Rust into the server level programming? And one of the answers, on, uh, basically that was, uh, that was, I think, the premise of this question is that uh, the, uh, the async communication and async IO is basically required to, to have the uh, so Rust could be taken into the server uh, level programming. So it seems that everyone is kind of an accepting, uh, expecting this these days. Uh, although there are some costs, right, of the of the reactive approach to I/O, and uh, I think that the most important cost is the complexity that we that we add to the system comparing to classical blocking synchronous calls. Well, after all, when we have asynchronous uh, 
uh, asynchronous I.O., we need to start to deal with concurrency. Well, this is the example that we have in our application. As you can see, it's uh, we basically needed to do timings for our Cassandra drive, uh, Cassandra operations. So what we figured out is that we would have a, a some a function that would take as a parameter uh, database operations, and that in that uh, another function that basically uh, generates uh, that produces uh, future. And in that function, uh, this is the this is the function that we uh, that we put as a parameter. What we wanted to do is the start timer. We are using Prometheus here. We wanted to start timer, and then perform whatever happens with this uh, with this execution at the end, whether there is error or not. We want to uh, lock the time of this operation, and at the end, return the future because well, probably the client of this of this call would like to map over it and retrieve the results. Now, this is what happens. Uh, and anyway, you think, oh, I was deceived. I'm using Scala. I shouldn't have null pointer exceptions. Well, so uh, the question for you: Do you see the obvious error in this, in this simple code, in the simple method? The, the person that spots the uh, accepted. Uh, the person that spots the error gets beer from me today on the. <laughs> because beer is for free, I guess. <laughs> uh, so okay, so this is, this is it's not very visible, right? So what happens here is basically we are invoking the 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 operation that produces future twice. So what we are doing is basically invoking the uh, the operation that pro that uh, that does the uh, Cassandra operation twice. And as there are some different objects within this uh, within this Cassandra-like statement, uh, they basically are being mutated. Uh, in, at the same time, concurrently, by uh, uh, in two different places, so you basically end up with the null pointer exception. And, and to be uh, and a funny thing, obviously, as the co with the concurrency problem is that you wouldn't. Uh, it's not very deterministic. It happens from time to time. The other lesson from that is don't program after after midnight when you are tired. And uh, this is another thing that is very typical. So what you can see here is like if you don't handle, uh, you know. Uh, uh, failures correctly, what can happen is something like this. Something returned from uh, Cassandra call, and it was caught by uh, uh, the response was caught somewhere on the, in, in the netty, uh, netty thread, and you have the stack trace, and there is no a single, not single place from your code. If you find something like this on the production happening once every week or something like that, it's very hard to, you know, to figure out what was the actual problem. Obviously, you can do it, right, if you, if you handle errors correctly, but, you know, how like this, right? There are always some uh, omissions. Uh, and last thing is to this complexity is that there are really many. Uh, it seems that there are many different knobs that you can use because when you had a blocking, you, you had only blocking synchronous I/O, and you had the request that uh, that arrived to your server, and you perform the database operation without the same thread, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you needed to tweak, for instance, only the number of uh, database connections. Now what you need to tweak is you need to think, all right, if I have maybe a quick database connections, maybe, and you are using Sleek, maybe I should have different thread pool for these types, and if I have long-running database operations, like maybe I should have a separate thread pool that would be used in Sleek for that. So uh, the question, like, and this is the point where I would give the, uh, uh, the uh, microphone to, uh, to Martin, who would talk about the experiment, is that we wanted to see where are the, the, the points and where exactly, in what cases, some uh, reactive approach uh, would pay off with this additional complexity being, you know, uh, somehow uh, returned, right, because of the uh, better performance. Okay, so... We wanted to compare classical synchronous stack with uh, this reactive one uh, in terms of free or even more things. Uh, basically, we wanted to compare efficiency, scalability, and development effort. So what answer we wanted to, 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 to receive? So we wanted to, to receive if we have some, uh, we, if we have some classical uh, sync uh, application, then if Low, if we have big load on on some server, the response times will be will be similar. How it scale? Of course, we know what should we expect, but if we will be able to to reproduce the, the this in our results, and also we wanted to <coughs> we wanted to 
check how big is difference in development effort. I think the the answer to to, spread, uh, to last question was given at least partially by Pavel, but uh, <clears throat> so how we wanted to do that? I think the the best way is just to pick two stack two stacks, reactive one and synchronous one, prepare two implementations of the same cases that we want to test, and then just test them. Uh, so what we wanted to test because we we could do some prepare some separate uh, prepare some separate cases then do uh, then do some tests on isolated case on isolated cases and or we can just prepare some whole ap whole application and test whole application right so testing application gives us additional complexity because because we can hit on problems that we were not aware of, and we can testing. We can receive different results because we are we're testing many things at the same time. But in case of what we wanted to to receive as result, we decided maybe this is this is the better approach. So we created some simple auction house application. From domain perspective, it's not very interesting in in terms of what in terms of this presentation, but I'll give a few details. So this is an application that gives users some possibilities to of do, do some auctioning. So user can do some operations from creating account through creating auctions, listing auctions to, to, to bidding and paying for auctions. More is interesting point from our perspective perspective is architecture. So we created this as microservice archi architecture with free services. Uh, auction service is also not very not very in interesting for us. More interesting is, for example, identity service, which of course manages uh, accounts and also uh, token verifications. So because of that, auction service and billing service with each request are uh, hitting into into identity service, and because of that, it has it has qu uh, quite heavy load. Also, quite inter interesting is billing service because. Uh, it's mostly performing one operation, F uh, payment finalization, which means that it's hitting to some external system, external slow legacy system, which waits one second, returns answer, and then after that, uh, it produces invoice, which is pushed into AWS S3. <coughs> and uh, services uh, are storing data into, into Cassandra database. Uh, so, as I said, we decided to, to create, in fact, two applications. So, this, this architecture was realized in two versions. Uh, first version, synchronous one, was done with classic servlets. We don't want to play with Java, so we decided to use Calatra. Uh, with, blocking, uh, with blocking S3 uh, API and with Synchronous Cassandra uh, data stack driver uh, in comparison with reactive uh, application, which was done with Akka HTTP because of its streaming nature, because of uh, known efficiency and known pop and popularity. Uh, Alpaca for connection with S3 because it fits quite well to, to the Akka HTTP and async uh, driver to, to Cassandra. <coughs> So, in terms of infrastructure, uh, we deployed everything with uh, Tectonic Kubernetes uh, into into AWS uh, cluster. So we have three nodes managed by uh, managed by Kubernetes. Uh, I mean, three nodes with application, one Cassandra node, and all all of that is managed by uh, by Kubernetes. Also, we have uh, Gatling in, in separated nodes just to, uh, to not share the same resources and not, not, uh, not have impact into, into, uh, into results of, of the evaluation. Mm. And we uh, created some tests to that. Uh, for tests, we used Gatling. Uh, this is quite quite nice uh, load testing framework in which we were using in which uh, we we were performing two scenarios simultaneously in different modes. 
So uh, one scenario was a create auction scenario where users in loop were creating new accounts and creating new auctions and they put in cloud on part of part of the application. And second second was bidder scenario where uh, there was action bidding and payment so this this slow external uh, external system was was called uh, and we've done three types of si uh, simulations to to check different things so we've done uh, heavy side user simulation this these names are gatling's name so i i'll, I'll t tell you what what this means so heavy side is uh, Kind of function with, which uh, which goes to some peak and then is decreasing load after some time, uh, and because of that we can we can test uh, how application work how application work at some peak load, and then if it's able after that to to to, to take request to process request uh, after that time. So this is this is quite I think real worst scenario because because when we have Events like I don't know Black Friday or something like that. Then, then we have some this kind of peak uh, peaks of load in in some servers. Uh, second second simulation that I've, that we've done is uh, ramping users. So in these simulations, we uh, we were increasing load in a linear way at uh, in with given time. Uh, and the point of the simulation was to 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 find to find the point at at which server stop will stop working. So this is this is a good way to to break a server. And sec and third one was injecting uh, injecting users at at once. I mean this and in this in this simulation, uh, users a big amount of users were were injected at once, and it was performing. Uh, request after request with quite big uh, big pauses between. It was good to it was good to check uh, it was good to check uh, how separated re requests behaves to check if if there are th there are if there are single types of requests that are causing uh, heavy load on on server side. And this this are basically all experiments that uh, that were done by by us. And I think. Person who, who will talk about the results will be will be Lukas. Okay, thanks. Um, I am a bit sick, so I might cough. So just please cover your ears. Okay, so before we get into um, neural data, the results. Um, let's discuss um, how those paradigms and how those frameworks map into the reality of load testing and performance. So um, first thing we have to consider is that Scalatra and Akka HTTP are completely different types of piece. So they are optimized towards completely different uh, goals. And Scalatra is the old gold server model. You get thread per request. You are expected to block on IO operations on those threads. You get Jetty. A servlet container underneath and uh, how it handles load. So when HTTP request comes, it's queued, then it's handled by the thread pool, and basically if you run out of threads, you have to wait in the queue. So Akka HTTP, on the other hand, does something completely different. So it uses actor system and it uses async managing uh, messaging between actors to be able to shelf the load, to be able to spread work onto all cores of the CPU. So what comes with this is this that we are expected to never block on threads and we are expected to perform IO operations in an asynchronous fashion. So there's also another thing about about Akka HTTP and that's that is optimized for streaming use cases and for persistent connections. And let's see how this precisely uh, maps into how Akka deals with connections. So here we have Apache Bench testing local Akka instance running in a container. And um, Apache Bench is configured to open new connections for every request in this case. And, and as you can see, well, we're not dealing with this very good. We're only able to serve 1,000 requests per second. So 
Let's change this a bit. And here we have the same test with K flag, which is, I guess, here. And that means that we are using keep alive. And that means that Apache Bench will open a connection pool and it will try to reuse connections. So when we do this, you can see that Akka is able to handle five times the load it was able to handle when we open new connections for every request. So let's compare this with Scalatra. So here we have Scalatra dealing with the problem of a new connection per request. And as you can see, it's dealing with this problem a bit better. It's uh, able to handle two times the load Akka HTTP was able to do. And that's mostly related to the fact that it doesn't have to uh, materialize the whole streaming graph, the whole streaming infrastructure for every connection. So let's add the keep alive flag uh, for Scalatra. And as you can see, it's doing a bit better, but it's not doing as good as Akka HTTP would. So uh, let's talk about the landscape in which we are running those load tests, because this is quite important to understand. And as much in already mentioned, identity service is screwed. It's going to get heavy load, and we aren't really expecting the service to be able to cope with it. It's going to get bashed. It's not going to handle with that. It's okay. We're going to treat this as a data point and see how it impacts the whole uh, result set. It's going to skew our end results and global results, but that's okay. We're just treating this as data. So on the other hand, Auction service is taking moderate traffic from one pool of users, and billing service only deals with uh, long-running connections on the end of the customer journey. So here we have data. So here we have heavy side load scenario in which 2,300 users are trying to perform operations on our stack. This is a synchronous stack on Scalatra, um, and it takes 300 seconds. As we can see um, here, um, those are the stories and endpoints used by Scalatra in identity, and identity is not coping as expected. But this is the important part of our story. Uh, here we have endpoints for auction house, and as you can see, the 50th percentile is quite okay, but then things get really rough. On the 75th percentile, we get two orders of magnitude more for requests. So this is the point in which we hit the thread pool. This is the moment when the thread pool really hits you with the queuing. So let's compare this with asynchronous stack and how Akka HTTP dealt, dealt with this. So first thing that comes is uh, identity, which is still not coping really well and as expected. But then we have completely different picture because as you can see here, up to 99th percentile, uh, we have quite nice latencies. Those people are getting their requests served in timely fashion. So um, what we're seeing here is that um, for most of the time, Akka HTTP and reactive stack is able to deliver on the promise of being responsive. It's actually able to deal with a heavy load. So let's try to visualize this data to better understand it. Here we have two charts. The top chart is synchronous stack, and we can see as the latencies grow in a steady fashion um, under the load, which is represented here by an amount of simultaneous users as this yellow line. You can see that all percentiles uh, of response times are growing, and everybody's waiting, so all response times are really bad. And async tells a completely different story, because Again, we have no green color on this chart. That means that 50th percentile is doing really well. They are getting their responses immediately. 75th percentile, which is turquoise color here, is um, quite slow, quite small, quite OK. And then we have outliers, the 99th and 99th, um, sorry, 95th and 99th percentile. Uh, one thing to notice here is that we have different scales. So uh, all responses from Scalatra were able to complete in uh, 50 seconds. Basically, the scale is in milliseconds. But there's a completely different thing for uh, async stack. We see that we have 200 seconds here. And that's a problem that we are going to address later. So let's talk about things that didn't really go that well in our project. 
And those things are mostly related to uh, developer experience. So we didn't have to um, put any effort to maintain the synchronous stack when we are running load tests. There was virtually uh, no effort required. It just worked. We just deployed applications, and well, results weren't that happy for most of the users, but it worked. Um, we can't tell the same thing about the reactive stack. So it took us, I think, about a week uh, to get the reactive stack to stop throwing errors in random places. And all we wanted to do was to just measure latencies, the maximum latencies. There, was, there were many um, toggles, configuration options. You, we really had to dig into the documentation. We really had to understand how this works and how guts of the system work. So we can easily say that all those uh, blowing up queues and timeouts that you get are something that you have to consider when designing such a system. You have to take uh, the learning curve into account. And let's talk about hard parts, things that were hard to understand. So here we have a ramp up scenario in which we, we wanted to overwhelm our stack. We wanted to um, give load that cannot be handled and see how those stacks will break, basically. So as you can see here, um, there's nothing new in the synchronous stack, really. You can see that latencies are still growing um, steadily for all percentiles. Everyone is really waiting, and system isn't responding. So it's unresponsive, we can say. But there's a Is with the problem is with the outliers again. So we have uh, 90 percentile and some even on 85 percentile of requests that take a really long time. Again, scale is different. This is 40 seconds. Here we have 400 seconds. So we wanted to understand what was causing this problem. And there are two things that we have to consider here. Uh, the one thing is the problem of unbounded concurrency in asynchronous systems. So when we um, remove the responsibility of our threads to wait for blocking operations to complete, those threads are then free to do something different. They can complete other jobs. And that means in uh, an API, that means that they will probably serve more traffic. So they will handle more traffic. and in this case, that means that you're basically throwing the load onto other systems that you depend on. So in our case, this limited resource uh, was Cassandra database and the capacity of Cassandra. So um, this is a nice uh, insight that we have gained in this experiment. So basically, Threadpool of Scalatra was doing a naive version of throttling only because there were a limited amount of threads. So um, Cassandra wasn't flooded with requests, with queries. Uh, on the other hand, Akka was trying to process things as fast as it could. And in the end, it was um, actually flooding Cassandra, which resulted um, in Cassandra being unstable. And in the end, it was responding four times slower for asynchronous stack, because it was just, well, we, we overreached. So this tells a part of the story, but Cassandra uh, actually, we, we measured those responses, and the longest response from Cassandra took 80 seconds. And as you can see, we have outliers that took 400 seconds here. So it's not the full story. So some of the requests were actually um, hanging inside of ACK HTTP. And this is one of the open questions that Pavel mentioned, things that we tried to understand but didn't find a definite answer to. Our working theory is that um, this can be compared probably to a trip in a car taken through a city. So most of the time, you won't get blocked on every red light in the city. Some you will stop, 
on some others you won't. But in some unfortunate cases, you will stop on every red light. And that means that some of those requests probably just got stuck on every possible queue, on every possible buffer on the end. And uh, under heavy load, this, is, this behavior was very, very hard to understand for us. So, um, so this experiment led us to some thoughts that we wanted to share with you about reactive systems and the nature of those reactive systems. So first thing is, you really have to consider whether you want to go reactive, whether you need to go reactive. And if you do, there are things that you have to consider. So the um, thing that is quite obvious for us after this experiment is that you should probably measure everything from the start. You should probably build infrastructure to do load testing from start. Because those applications will behave in a different way that you think they will behave under heavy load. And to understand this behavior, you really have to have the data. You can't deal with this in production when you hit the spike. And the other thing is that your mileage will vary. It's not whether it may vary, it will vary. Because those applications handle different use cases, handle traffic in different scenarios in very different ways. And you really have to put the effort to measure things to pin them down and to understand how those reactive stacks work underneath to make them work for you in the best way and to serve your customers. And that will be all from us. Thank you very much for listening. Here you have a QR code that would lead you to this link. This link is our GitHub repo that we have prepared for this presentation. It contains the whole build and if you want you can build everything if you if you just have AWS account. Questions? I guess it's the latest one. Um, I think that's 1107, yes. Mm. Well, we took the latest one from the documentation. It was two months ago, so. Please. Yes, basically, yes. Yes, exactly, you are completely right, but that's not the point, that's not what we wanted to test. Um, so what we were interested in was how those systems will behave in um, stressful situations when those resources are limited. We do understand that if we just added more Cassandra nodes, things would go um, probably like in the heavy side scenario where, you, where we had those nice latencies on the whole stack, on the whole, um, on all percentiles. But that wasn't the point. We wanted to see how those things behave. That, that's why we added overloaded service, that's why we added uh, the waiting period in payment system. So we wanted to see how those systems behave under heavy load and with problems. That's a hard one. So basically, um, the proposal is to always use them in situations where you have high I.O. and um, you need to deal with it in a fast way. But there's a problem that I mentioned, the unbounded concur concurrency problem, and uh, reactive stream specification is taking this in a good direction because they are trying to um, give you back pressure and everything would work fine for us really if uh, just we had the reactive driver for Cassandra that would honor the back pressure that Cassandra would give us but as far as I know most databases don't really support this concept and that's uh, the point in which you have back pressured reactive microservice but you still um, smash the resources that you have 
on spikes on logic level. So it works on the TCP level, it works on the request level, uh, it works on the data streaming level of requests, but it doesn't really work for things like uh, should I fire those 10 requests to Cassandra for this single query? We have no way to really uh, push back. So um, if you need high load, if you need to handle um, big amounts of traffic and you have capabilities to somehow monitor things and do auto scaling, that's a good case, I think. But for small applications, well, the cost of uh, the development cost is quite high, really. And you have to consider it. You have to really take it into account. But in small applications, usually we we can't hit these problems, really. I mean, this is other other case. I mean, if we if we have some small application, we probably w wouldn't see the the things that we w we saw in our presentation. Very true statement, and I don't have any answer to that. And as far as I know, um, ACA people are aware of this problem, and it's an open question, really. Uh, I think they are not, but we will add this presentation link to the documentation, which is in readme. Okay, so is that a statement or is it a question, really? Because I'm. I'm <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so, yeah, and no, because um, it's not a problem if you have enough threads and if you have less users than threads. And Scalatra is clearly a win in productivity, as far as we, as far as far as we were thinking about developers not digging into documentation, that's fine. And there are use cases when you are just forced to handle high traffic for enterprise microservices, and I think that uh, it's, it's just obvious that you would use async solution there, and you wouldn't even consider going synchronous again. But yeah, it's an open question. There are no easy answers. You really have to uh, check things for you. Okay, so here we have two things here. Uh, first would be how ACA HTTP is specific thing, because ACA HTTP is quite specific due to being um, based on reactive streams, and that means that um, it's basically really more geared toward streaming use cases and persistent connections, which is a good thing because HTTP2 is just behind the corner and uh, we are going to get those persistent connections whether we want or not. Um, Sorry, got brain dead. Could you repeat the last part? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
So yeah, basically this is this is a thing to consider in every asynchronous application and I know that there were some attempts to uh, cover this bridge because this is the problem of um, stack traces being not continuous due to going through async uh, point. And there were some approaches to try and deal with this and um, I've never seen a um, really good one um, but there's also the approach of coroutines. I'm not sure if Kotlin coroutines are handling this problem a better way. They probably should, and they probably should allow for uh, stack uh, concatenation. But I don't, I don't know if it's really working that well. So um, this problem really uh, comes up if in every reactive or async platform. For instance, Node uh, has those problems too. Any other questions? Yeah, that's a very good question because um, Scala is a language in which uh, when you program you expect things to just work and it works for most of the time but in this particular case you have uh, quite a lot of queues and buffers and things that you don't really expect there to be and well you might imagine that there has to be something that will give when the load hits and Basically, uh, those exceptions weren't really e expected by us. So uh, when a load really hit those servers, it turned out that there are lots of myriads of options to configure timeouts in different places. Because Akka is trying by default to do the right thing. That's not what you always want. And that's the point in which you really have to dig into documentation, understand um, the queue sizes, why those queue sizes are precisely in this configuration on the default layer and what you get when you enlarge them, what you get when you scale them down, that's quite tricky and you really have to understand it. Okay, thank you very much for listening.